Okay. Well, it's uh, it's week three. It's um, I mean, it's it's Tuesday, week three, and uh, and so that means on Thursday we'll have our midterm exam, which will cover basically the first two weeks of the course. All right, and so that'll you know our, your first four lectures, uh, all the material there. Um, and do we have any questions about the exam or any questions about any content? Yes, question. Will will there be code on the exam? Um, not really. No, uh, it will be mostly handwritten, mostly kind of conceptual based. Uh, so so yeah, no no code on the exam. Okay. Um, you will want to bring a calculator. Okay. You'll definitely need a calculator for the exam, and um, I don't know, pencil eraser. It'll be right here. Any kind of calculator or just... Yeah, any kind of calculator. Not not your computer. Don't say you're going to use the calculator on your computer, but uh, yeah, any any calculator is fine. Oh, I, I, I guess no phones. Not your phone calculator. So just a standalone, non-internet connected device. Anything else? Did uh, homework two go okay? Questions about that? Concerns? Okay. All right. All right. Then um, we'll carry on. Okay. So um, just. Just kind of a recap of where we have been, uh, where we're going, and the big picture of the class, okay? So again, uh, the big picture of the class is, so this will be our uh, recap of the course so far. Okay, so big picture of the course. Ah, my computer. <laughs> okay, hang on. All right, well, does anyone want to tell me uh, what they believe to be the uh, big picture of the course? So it's uh, Monte Carlo methods, right? So, so why why do we bother with Monte Carlo methods in the first place? What's that? No, no, that's that's one of the techniques. Inverse CDF is one of the techniques. But why why do we even bother with Monte Carlo methods in the first place? Yes, we, we're going to use the computer's randomness to get estimates for questions that would otherwise require difficult math operations. Okay, so big picture of the course, we want to avoid difficult math. Like integrals. So we want to avoid difficult math, so we use kind of randomness to help us get an estimate. Help, help us find estimates. Okay. So, um, so that's kind of the big picture, and um, <clears throat> and the idea is we might have some kind of distribution, okay? So you know we start off 
example, there is some distribution and maybe uh, we want to get an estimate of the mean of the distribution or the variance of the distribution, right? There's some distribution we want to estimate the mean of the distribution. Okay. Classical method would require us to integrate x times p of x dx, right? So analytic approach would be that the expected value of x would be the integral of x times p of x dx. Okay. Monte Carlo approach. What's the Monte Carlo approach? We would draw what? Random values from p of x and then take the sample mean, right? Take the sample mean of those values and that should be would be an estimate of the expected value of x, right? That's what we do, right? So we just want to draw random values from p of x, and we're going to take the sample mean of those values, and we have an estimate of that, OK? And so we learned a couple strategies for drawing random values from p of x, OK? Um, and what, what are those? Strategies or methods to draw random values from p of x. Okay, so what was, what was kind of the first one that we did? Inverse CDF. So that's one way for us to get Okay, inverse CDF method. What else do we have? Rejection sampling. And then we also had like convolutions, right? Okay, and then uh, and then beyond this, hang on, I think I zoomed in on accident again. Okay, so we have inverse CDF, rejection sampling, and convolutions, and then applications of this were um, beyond just getting the mean. We can also estimate, you know. Um, you know, values of functions, like if we want to apply a function to a random variable, which uh, could happen. Um, the Monte Carlo approach is just to, uh, to take the random sample, apply the function, and, and get your estimates that way also as well, right? Um, okay, and then we can We can also apply functions to our random samples and estimate integrals. Okay. Which, uh, which I think you did in your most recent homework. And then, um, and then last week I covered importance sampling, which is basically a, a weighted version of estimating the integrals and estimating the functions 
And, and that, that appears in your homework this week. Okay, so this week we have homework. Okay, so this is what we've done so far. Um, I want to, uh, you know, when we draw random values from p of x so far, all of our p of x's have been univariate, okay? So far, all of our distributions have been of a single dimension. Um, and a lot of times we will be in situations that are more complicated and will be of higher dimensions, okay? We might have, you know, two dimensions or 17 dimensions or 150 dimensions or something like that, okay? We, yes, we did cover a bivariate normal. That, that is, uh, we did cover that, okay? But, if, but we might have, you know, situations where our density, our P of X, is, uh, is multidimensional, right? X, our random variable X could be of, you know, high dimensionality, and so P of X, the density over that, would also be, uh, have high, high dimensionality. Okay. And so, um, so we are going to head towards um, being able to conquer or uh, to tackle high dimensional functions, okay? Same, same idea, okay? We want to estimate properties of this high dimensional function. It's difficult to do analytically, so we just take a random sample and use that. Okay. Uh, so that's that's something that we'll do in the future. Um, bef uh, and I, uh, but before that, well, I don't know about before that. Uh, that high dimensional um, distributions, those come into play uh, quite often in Bayesian statistics, okay? And so um, my assumption here is that most of you have not had any formal training in Bayesian statistics, and so I think we need to spend at least a full lecture covering some of the basics of Bayesian statistics so that when we get into the applications of these high dimensional um, distributions, and the application is applicable to, you know, kind of a, a, a Bayesian situation. We'll at least have the uh, the appropriate framework to uh, to do this. Okay, so this will be this today's lecture will kind of be a slight detour in getting into kind of the concepts of Bayesian statistics, so that when we resume covering Monte Carlo methods for kind of higher dimensional. Um, distributions and, and look at the applications, uh, it, it will make a little bit more sense, okay? So if today's lecture, well, <laughs> I don't know, it, you know, feels a little off topic, um, it, it is so by, by choice, okay? So, um, so this is what we've done so far. Let me do, um, just cover a little bit of the future. Future, we will look at uh, high dimensional Uh, distributions. So basically now we're dealing with a, a vector x. x exists in, I don't know, d dimensions. And p of x is a high dimensional function. Density function. Okay, um, and so we will uh, look at this and we'll have strategies for handling uh, high dimensionality, high dimensional functions. Okay, and uh, major application Be uh, Bayesian statistics, and so today's lecture will be uh, kind of a intro slash crash course in. Uh, 
and Bayesian statistics. Okay. Okay, so um, <coughs> all right. Does it? Do you guys know much about Bayesian statistics? Does anyone want to tell me what what their ideas or concepts are of Bayesian stats? Like, if somebody said, you know, what's I keep hearing this idea of Bayesian stats. What's what's Bayesian stats all about? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. It comes from Bayes' rule. All right. Um, I, I think it, it, it's a little bit more than it's just Bayes' rule. <laughs> Bayes' rule is a huge part of it. Absolutely. Um, let's uh, let's just contrast this. So um, okay, let's go back to classical stats. All right. So you're kind of your classical statistics. So if you think back to your intro stats course, when you created a confidence interval, what was the interpretation of a confidence interval? So classical statistics could you like if you created a 95% confidence interval Right? You guys remember doing this, making 95% confidence intervals? Okay, so let's say you're like the mean height of people. This is, uh, this is, you're trying to estimate the average height of an adult in the United States or something. So for men and women and everybody together, you create a 95% confidence interval and you're saying, I'm 95% confident that the average height is between 5'6 and 5'8 or something like that. I don't know. I'm just making that up. Okay. Um, what, did, what did that mean? Are you allowed to say there's a 95% probability that the average height is between 5'6 and 5'8 and a half or whatever? Why not? Why couldn't you say there, there's a 95% probability? Because in classical statistics, that parameter, the mean of the population, is a constant. Okay, we treat that as a constant value. It is unknown to us, but it's constant, and there's no variation about it. Okay, that was that was how it worked in classical statistics. Is that um, distributions? are defined by parameters. And the parameters are constants. Or I'm going to just call them fixed values. Parameters are fixed values um, and unknown to us. Okay. So we would say, I am 95% confident that mu is between blank and blank. That's what we said, OK? And, uh, and, you know, and we would say, do not say there is a 95% probability. Okay. okay, Bayesian statistics, we change this up. Okay, this is the biggest shift. In Bayesian statistics, the parameters themselves are random values.
Okay, the parameters themselves are random values. The mean of the population is not a fixed thing. Okay, the mean of the population is a random value determined not even determined it's a random value okay kind of this the idea that uh, um, that you know there's there's a distribution itself that defines the mean of the population and um, you know, as, as the population fluctuates and changes and things like that, you know, the mean of the mean of the, uh, the population also fluctuates and changes, and the mean itself, the parameter, is a random value, okay? And so if the parameter is a random value, the parameter is then a draw or a realization from its own probability distribution, okay? Because if it's a random value, then there's got to be a probability distribution describing what random values are, um, are, are allowed, okay? So the parameters themselves are random values, and so the parameter like mu is defined by a probability distribution. Okay. And so in Bayesian statistics, um, we don't have hypothesis tests, OK? Because in hypothesis testing, you have a null hypothesis that mu is equal to some value. Like mu is equal to 100. And you do a, a test to see, um, does the data conflict with this hypothesis that mu is equal to a value, OK? Because mu, the parameter, is defined by a probability distribution, we can no longer say it's equal to some exact number, OK? Mu just comes from a distribution. Maybe the most likely value in that distribution is 100. But because it's coming from a random distribution, of course, mu can be a little higher, can be a little bit lower. Okay, The parameters themselves are defined by probability distributions. The, the implications of this are Um, are pretty, uh, pretty, well, I don't know. In the beginning, it seems like just a small change, but, but it actually changes a lot, okay? <laughs> All right, and so, you know, I mean, at, at, the, at the least, now we say, we can say things like there's a 95% probability that mu is between this value and this value, because now it's coming from a probability distribution, okay? So now we can say, so now we say there's a 95% probability that mu is between blank and blank, okay? Because it, because it does come from a probability distribution. The um, kind of the I don't know the quintessential the 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 most uh, I don't know the example we use the most is probably the beta binomial um, beta binomial setup for uh, Bayesian statistics. Okay, um, so let's uh, let's take a look at this. All right. So let's go back to, um, let's also s explore uh, Bayes' rule. Okay. 
And Bayes' rule was probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B, which can be written as the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Okay, so this was Bayes' rule. In, um, in Bayesian statistics, we will have something like the probability of the parameter given the data. Okay, so oftentimes we uh, will write theta and probability of theta given d, d for data, okay? And this will be written this way. It'll be the probability of the parameters theta divided, uh, given data is equal to the probability of data given theta times the probability of theta divided by the probability of data, right? So this is just, this is exactly the same as Bayes' rule. And, uh, and so let's just kind of take a look at this. Probability of theta given the data. This will be the probability distribution of the parameter theta. Given that the data is D. Okay? So it is after we look at the data D, what is the distribution? What values of theta are likely, right? It's the probability distribution of the parameter theta. So this will tell us, you know, that is to say, what values of theta are likely or unlikely given the data we see. Because okay. that, that's all a probability distribution is, right? Probability distribution tells you what data, what values are likely, what values are unlikely. Okay, so we got that. Probability of theta given data. This is what we want. We want this. Okay. And we call this, this is known as the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution is theta given data. Okay. All right. This, the next, so at each piece, then we have probability of D given theta. The probability of the data given the probability of the data Okay, uh, the data is treated as fixed, uh, a fixed thing that we have observed. Okay, the probability of the data, a fixed, uh, a fixed set that we have observed. Given, um, probability of the data given um, the parameter theta. Okay, this is the probability of the data, a fixed set that we've observed, given the parameter theta. So this is a function of theta. It is a function for all the different possible values of theta what is the probability of this exact data that we have? Okay, so this is this is a function a 
function of theta. Okay, it's uh, basically it says for any given value of theta, what is the probability of my data D? Okay, or we call this what is the likelihood? What is the probability of my data? This is also known as what is the likelihood of my data? I'm going to run out of space here. Let me, uh, Right, let me just move some things around on the board <laughs> so that it, it all fits. All right, so we have uh, we have that, okay, and then now we have uh, probability of theta. This is the the distribution the distribution of what theta could be. Prior to seeing the data. Okay, so this is known as the prior distribution. Okay, so this is the distribution of what theta could be prior to uh, seeing any data. So, so before we even looked at the data, we say, you know, I think these values of theta are likely and these values of theta are unlikely, I don't know, based on something, <laughs> okay? And then, um, and then lastly, we have P of D, okay? This is, again, keep in mind, D is, a, is fixed. This is our data. D is fixed. D, our data is fixed. Okay, and so P of D is a constant. And it is the probability of getting our set of data um, for any and all possible values of theta. Okay, so it is, so it's basically what's the probability of getting this data that I've observed if I, um, if I consider the entire universe of an possibilities of theta. Okay, and it all boils down to a single number because our D data is fixed. Okay, so D is a constant, probability of D is a constant and is the probability of our data if we consider every single possible value possible value of theta. This is called the marginal. The marginal probability. Okay. 
it it's just a constant and really it just serves as a way to make sure that this result probability of theta given the data its purpose is so that well it's not its purpose but by including this it ensures that this thing ends up being a probability distribution which will integrate to one if we integrate um, integrate all the possible values right because because the PDF has to integrate to one and so um, it ensures that um, probability of theta given data the integral of this over uh, theta is equal to one okay so it ensures that the integral of your posterior integrates to the value one okay I put a lot of stuff up on this slide here okay uh, but I want to make sure I don't know that it, that it will kind of it will work and make sense here all right so what we want to get is the posterior distribution of theta so we're saying so the big idea in Bayesian statistics is that our parameters theta themselves are random variables which will have their own probability distributions okay so if it has its own probability distribution we want to know what is going to be the distribution what values of theta are likely or unlikely given that I have this set of data that's going to be the posterior distribution and the way we calculate that is we use Bayes rule and we say well if the probability of A given B is this is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B then the probability of our parameter theta given our data can be found using this exact thing probability of D given theta times the probability of theta divided by the probability of D so we say this posterior distribution is what we want can be found using these three pieces okay we need to have the likelihood we need to have the prior and we need to have the marginal okay let's um, let's try this out with an example and and see if it makes sense okay so we're gonna do um, what's known as the beta beta binomial model okay okay and the idea here is our data comes from a binomial distribution okay so what's the binomial distribution We measure the number of successes given what? Based on a fixed number of trials n, and each trial has probability p, right? So uh, binomial distribution is x is equal to the number of successes, and then we have parameters. Uh, n, which is the number of trials, and theta, which is the prob, or we'll we'll do p. I don't know. Should we use theta or p? I I don't know. I don't even know what letter to use now. Okay, we'll say, yeah, let's do theta. Okay, theta, which will be the probability of success. Is that okay? I know in. Um, your intro class, it's usually P, but we're, we're going to use theta here, all right? Okay, so our data comes from a binomial distribution. And what we're going to say, so normally, in your stats, intro stats class, your stats 10 class, we would say something like, I don't know, this, the coin has a probability of landing heads 50%. You're going to flip the coin 10 times 
what's the probability that the, you get four heads out of 10 flips, right? And in that case, you want to know what's the probability that x equals 4, given that n equals 10, and theta equals 0.5, okay? And that's a straightforward calculation, right? 10 choose 4, 0.5 to the 4 times 1 minus 0.5 to the 6. Maybe, maybe I said that too quickly. But, but, but it's a straightforward calculation. You look up the binomial distribution formula, you plug in your numbers, your n, your theta, and your x, you get a number out. In those cases, we, we assumed that theta was a fixed value, okay? Um, or if you recall, maybe uh, have, you guys have done maximum likelihood estimation, right? And so how does maximum likelihood estimation work out? You'd say, given your data, what value of theta will maximize my likelihood function? Okay, so I, this will, th let me just contrast this. Or, well, uh, let's not get there yet, okay. I'll, I'll contrast this in a moment. I, I, I want to include the uh, beta part, okay? And, uh, and the beta part is uh, that theta, so in kind of Bayesian statistics, We say that theta comes from a beta distribution. Okay? We're going to say that theta comes from a beta distribution. Okay. So the idea here is we've got a beta distribution, and the beta distribution produces a value theta. Okay, so this is um, the value theta, and based on theta, our data is a realization of the binomial distribution, okay? So the beta produces theta, beta distribution produces theta, and our data x is a realization of the binomial distribution. Okay, so this is what we've got. Um, let's uh, let's talk about baseball because I think this is a decent, it's a good example, and uh, and you, we'll look at this example in the homework as well. Okay, do any of you guys watch baseball? Some of you. Okay, so. There's all sorts of stats, and, and the, this statistic batting average is probably not the best measure of how good a batter is, but it's, it is very frequently used, and you know whenever you see a batter go up um, to, uh, to hit the ball, and on TV they always show the batting average. Okay? They'll show it for the, tonight's game, and then also it, their season's batting average or their career batting average and things like that. Okay. And if you know anything about baseball, what what would be considered a good batting average? Yeah, okay. So if if the batting average is over 0.3, okay? So the batting average is the number of times the uh, the player has an at bat, okay? An at bat is considered when they step up to the plate and, and they swing the ball, they get generally three chances, okay? Or um, more than that, but you know, they're allowed uh, you know, three strikes. And if they manage to hit the ball and run 
to first at least make it to a base, okay? That's considered a hit, okay? So if they just make contact with the ball, but then they're put out, that, that does not count, okay? So that, that's not a hit, okay? So, so a hit means they successfully made it to base, okay? Um, because they hit the ball. Um, there's other rules like they can get to base because the pitcher did poorly and stuff, but those don't count in the batting average. So, so uh, the batting average, uh, a good batting average is something around 0 .3, 0 .31 would be considered very good, okay? And, uh, and we report this as 310, okay? So 0 .310 is reported as 310, which means this player, out of around 10 opportunities to hit the ball, they've successfully made it to base only about three out of those 10 times, okay? And that's considered great, or uh, that's considered very good, okay? Um, and then a bad batting average in, uh, in the major leagues would be around like 0.2, okay? That would be considered pretty bad, okay? So, so the difference between a good, very good player and a very bad player would be something around uh, like one one successful hit out of ten at bats. Okay, and a player will probably get four at bats in a game. Okay, and so so the 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 window of what's like between good and bad in baseball is 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 pretty narrow. Okay, you don't really have players who have. Uh, let me, let, I'm going to just look up on Wikipedia highest um, batting career highest career batting average I think it's Mickey Mantle or wait Ty Cobb let's see list of major league baseball player career batting average leaders Ty Cobb okay the greatest of all time, Ty Cobb, 0.366, okay? That's, uh, that's, that's the greatest career batting average of all time. And let's see, okay, and then 0 0.31 puts you in the top 100 of all time, okay? This is like a, over 100 years of baseball history, okay? In 100 years of baseball history, if you get a career batting average of point. And, and look at the difference between top 50 and top 100 is, you know, 0 0.3196 and 0 0.3108, okay? This is, uh, you know, 0 0.31, 0 0.3110 and 0 0.312 is, you know, that's one 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 thousandth of a point, but, you know, that, that separates quite a few, right? So, so anyway. You've got this uh, very narrow band of uh, batting averages, okay? And so we could just, we could have a, let's think of baseball here. Let's, let's go to a new slide, actually. We'll look at batting averages. And uh, you know, good batting average would be something around 0 0.310. Okay, and then a bad batting average. What was the Eric Mendoza? Eric Mendoza line. What's the Mendoza line? Oh, Mario Mendoza. Okay, so this is. Mario Mendoza, yeah, is around 0 0.2, okay? Mendoza's career average is 0 0.215. So in, uh, in baseball, if your batting average is below 0 0.2, that, that's considered quite bad. And, uh, and you need to be uh, like skilled in other aspects of the, uh, of the game, such as uh, fielding, like being able to stop people from um, advancing on base and things like that. Uh, your defense skills have to be quite good to, uh, to, to stay on the team, right? Because on the team, they only want like your 
your 40 man roster they only want like the 40 best people that they can have and so if you are terrible at batting you have to be bringing something else important to the game like like you're a pitcher okay pitchers will have terrible batting averages but if you're a batter then um, you know your defense like at shortstop or something must be really good okay and so there's something known as the Mendoza line who was was kind of uh, the nickname for uh, this baseball player who was really bad at batting okay I, I don't know is that his career batting average is 0.215 which is considered poor um, but he was he was very good at defense and so they said they kind of joked that there's this cutoff line around point two that says you know if you're below this you're gonna get kicked off so 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 bad battering average around point two okay and basically you're not gonna have um, very few people will have batting averages outside of this range Okay, so imagine we have a new, or we have a player. I, I pick, maybe not even pick, okay? Yeah, okay, we'll just say I pick a uh, random batter from Major League Baseball, okay? So I pick a random batter. And, uh, and I'm not going to tell you anything about this batter's skill, okay? And I ask, what do you think this person, this batter's batting average is? What would you guess? Or can you draw a distribution for what this person's batting average is? So I pick a random batter from MLB, and I just say draw a distribution to represent your beliefs about uh, this batter's um, batting average, which will be theta. What would your distribution look like? So a batting average, by nature of how it's calculated, can technically be anywhere from 0 to 1. Okay. But would we say, OK, because I don't know anything about this player, his batting average could be anywhere from 0 to 1. Okay. I mean, technically, that's true, because the way we calculate batting averages is number of at-bats divided by number of, I'm sorry, uh, number of hits divided by number of at-bats, it can go anywhere from 0 to 1. And so if we say, uh, let's just make a uniform distribution over 0 to 1, is, is that a good thing? No, what, what do you think our batting average distribution should look like? Okay, well let's, maybe we'll break this down. Six point seven point nine point three point one. Okay, all right. Let's just draw something here. Okay, all right, what do you think the probability that the batting average is between 0 0.9 and 0 0.1? Zero, right? Like it's it's gonna be like right around zero. If maybe uh, <laughs> okay. And then what about from like 0 0.7 to 0.9? Also zero, okay. What about anything over 0 0.5 for this person's career batting average? Zero, right? Okay, because the greatest of all time, Ty, what did we say? Ty Cobb was 0 0.366, probably. The random person I've picked 
is not going to be the greatest of all time, okay? And so, really, anything over 0.4 is going to be very close to zero, right? And then, what about, uh, you know, we also know this person is a professional baseball player, that they're in MLB, so what is the probability that their batting average is below 0.1? pretty close to zero, right? If not zero, pretty close to zero. And then, you know, what about point two? Now, now this is like a non-zero thing, okay? So we're gonna have, we should have a distribution that probably looks something, it's really hard to draw on this thing, but probably something that looks like this, okay? This should, should be a little bit rounder, something like that, okay? This is, this is what our distribution should look like. Do we agree that our distribution on what theta should be should be something like this, right? Okay. So this is what we believe to be our uh, player's batting average. Before we look at anything, we don't, we don't know anything about this player. We just know this is a, a batter, not a pitcher, okay? Okay, we're not going to look at batting averages of pitchers, but we're going to say this is a, a batter. Uh, we want to know what their, we're going to just guess what the player's batting average is. Okay, it's going to look something like this, right? Okay, now let's say uh, we observe this player play a couple games, okay? And we observe 10 at-bats by this player, okay? So maybe uh, we see the player at two games or something, 10 at-bats. And how does the player do? The player um, gets five hits. The player gets five hits, OK? And so the batting average for those 10 at-bats is 5 over 10, 0.5. So, or we'd say this person is batting 500, OK? All right. We observe 10 at-bats. The player gets five hits. The batting average for those 10 at-bats is 0.5. OK. So let me contrast, at this point, the difference between Bayesian statistics and classical statistics. So in classical statistics, we have maximum likelihood estimation, right? So um, let's just look at classical stats. We have maximum likelihood estimation. And I hope this part is familiar to you guys, right? So our data is what? We have 10 at-bats. So this is n equals 10. And we have 5 hits. x equals 5, OK? And theta is unknown. OK. So, uh, and, and uh, oh, and I'm sorry, x comes from the binomial distribution, right? So we're going to assume that every at-bat is independent and things like that, right? So what is the likelihood of our data? The likelihood of the data, OK? is going to be um, basically uh, the uh, likelihood of our data is going to be the product of each data point, right? Binomial distribution. And so basically, each x is Bernoulli. OK. 
Okay, and so what this ends up being is uh, we take each x sub i raised to the, uh, I'm sorry, we take uh, theta raised to the x sub i. It's going to be the product of i equals 1 to n times 1 minus theta to the n minus, um, or 1 minus x sub i, which ends up being uh, theta to the x and 1 minus theta to the uh, n minus x, okay? Or basically, x is equal to the sum of the x sub i's. Okay, and this is, this is the likelihood of our data. Okay, so in our case, with uh, x equal to 5, we have theta raised to the 5th times 1 minus theta raised to the 10 minus 5. And, uh, and this gives us yeah, theta to the fifth times one minus theta to the fifth. Okay, so this is our likelihood function. So the likelihood function of theta. And if we graph this, and we consider all values from 0 to 1, what does this look like? Okay. okay we're going to say um, S will be a sequence from 0 to 1 uh, by equals 0 0.001 f will be a function of s where we're going to do s to the 5 times 1 minus s to the 5 and then we'll do um, p is going to be f of s and we will plot s versus p type equals l okay and this is what our function looks like Maybe I'll just copy this. All right, so there we go. So the likelihood function of theta looks like this. So if we plug in um, 0, we get 0. If we plug in 1, we also get 0. And, uh, and all of these values in between look like this, right? And we say, what value of theta maximizes? Maximizes the function, OK? Well, we can look at this and uh, just looking tells us about theta is around 0 0.5. We can uh, take the derivative of this and, uh, and maximize it, right? And, uh, and usually taking the derivative of the likelihood function is tricky, so we usually end up taking the derivative of the log likelihood instead. Okay, so we'll, uh, you know, we will um, ddx or dd theta the log likelihood. So dd theta of 5 log theta times 5 times 1 minus log 5 of log 1 minus theta. And, uh, and this will give us 5 over theta times 5 times 
one minus theta, and we, um, we set this equal to zero, and we solve for theta, and I don't know. But basically, when you solve for theta, you should get theta equals to uh, 0 0.5, right? Unless I did my math wrong here. I think I did it. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a negative here because of uh, chain rule. Okay, so you get a... Uh... Anyway, okay, so um, the theta that maximizes the likelihood is 0 0.5, all right? So based on these 10 at-bats, where the player had five hits, what this tells me is that my estimate of this player's batting average at this point in time of the data is that this player's batting average is 0.5. Okay? So, and we have to stop and think, and we, and we say, does that make sense? Does it make sense that our player's batting average, our guess for the player's batting average is 0.5? According to maximum likelihood, yeah, of course that makes sense because he got five hits out of 10, okay? But if we take into account, let's just think, right? We go back, we say, okay, you know, I mean, after, because we did so much math, maybe we, we've lost sight of what we were trying to do, but, you know, I just, I just told you that the greatest baseball player, or the highest batting, not the greatest baseball player of all time, but the highest batting average of all time is uh, 0.366, and you know, anything over 310 is good, and we said the likelihood, the probability that someone's batting average is 0.5, that should be around zero, okay? So my maximum likelihood is telling me, you saw 10 at-bats, five of them were hits, our batting average is going to be, our best guess for batting average is 0.5, but then our knowledge of baseball tells us that that, that doesn't quite make sense. So what, what do we do? What, what seems, how do we explain that we have 5 out of 10 hits? So with Bayesian statistics, what we're saying is that, you know, more likely what's going on is that this player's batting average is still somewhere in this zone of between, you know, 0.2 and 0.3-ish, and the player just had a lucky streak of, of getting five hits out of 10, 10 at-bats. Okay, because that could happen, right? And we're saying this was more likely uh, a stroke of good luck than it was. This is now we have the uh, you know highest career batting average of all time, ever, by by far. Okay. So um, so maximum likelihood estimation says this. Bayesian statistics says hold on, a batting average of 0.5. Oh, something just happened. That that doesn't seem to quite make sense. Okay, so MLE says we should guess that theta is equal to zero point five. You know, we also have error bars. We you know we with uh we will also have. Uh, large standard errors, okay? But that's what MLE says, okay? Bayesian stats will say will say a batting average of 0.5 is way too high, okay? The batting average is probably between 0.2 and 0.3 and the player had a bit of 
luck. Which to professional athletes saying their good performance was luck is is like an incredible insult. So, <laughs> but but we'll just we'll just say it like this, okay? And um, and so what in uh, in Bayesian statistics we're going to say that the, um, the theta comes from a beta distribution, okay? And so we're going to say. Um, Prior to uh, looking at the data, we guessed theta comes from a distribution that looks like this. Okay, ranging from zero to one with something you know between 0.2 and 0.3 this is kind of what our our distribution looks like okay we guess the theta comes from here all right so mathematically this kind of distribution can be represented with a beta distribution mathematically we can represent distributions of theta with a beta distribution. Okay, a beta distribution can be used to represent um, distributions of theta where theta is a value representing a probability. Okay, so the, its range or I mean its domain goes from zero to one. Okay. You're not going to have a probability higher than one. You're not going to have a probability lower than zero. So um, um, theta is a probability um, you know, with probability. Uh, and so theta is going to come from the interval zero to one. And the beta distribution it can be thought of a distrib as a distribution of distributions it, I'm sorry is a distribution of probabilities it's a distribution of probabilities that's what we've got here So let's um, we'll look up the beta distribution, and so the beta distribution can go anywhere um, it's got this PDF okay um, alpha minus one one okay so we'll say um, the probability of theta for the beta distribution is equal to um, it's uh, technically it's this thing okay ah gamma of alpha plus beta divided by gamma alpha times uh, gamma beta times theta to the alpha minus one and one minus theta to the beta minus one okay this part looks scary this gamma stuff people are afraid of the gamma function okay you don't need to be you don't need to be afraid of the gamma function it's just it's just the factorial function okay but it's made continuous but you don't even need to worry about this term this term here the sole purpose of this term is so that this stuff, when we take the integral of it, will integrate to one, okay? This is a constant, constant so that probability of theta integrates to one. Okay, that's, that's the only 
that's its own pur only purpose, okay? And it's, it's just gam gamma functions, gamma functions look scary, but they're, it's just integrals. Okay. I'm not integrals, it's just the factorial function with an adjustment, okay? It's like, like three factorials, three times two times one, so you get six, and four factorial is four times three times two times one, so you get 24, and five factorial is, you know, 120, okay? But what would be, can you have three and a half factorial? Okay, and the gamma basically just connects the dots with a smooth line and says three and a half factorial should be this number here, okay? That's, that's all that the gamma function is. But anyway, we've got this. And, uh, and so the beta distribution is a distribution of probabilities and, um, and we can, this is, uh, I'm gonna just kinda take a shortcut and I think, um, let me take a look at your homework. I think I used the numbers 81 and 219. Let me see. Let me open. Something happened again. Oh, I broke it. Oh, okay. That's not what I wanted. Okay, so um, so we'll say this can be represented kind of with a beta distribution of eighty one to nineteen ish. Okay, don't don't worry about those numbers eighty one to nineteen just yet. Okay, and uh, and so if we use that, we can then say so if we have um, if we say probability of theta is equal to beta distribution 81 to 19, then um, this gives me the probability of theta. I'm going to just use the proportional symbol and get rid uh, to just so I don't have to write out the, uh, the constant here. We're going to say we've got theta raised to the 80th times 1 minus theta raised to the 218. And just so you can see what that looks like, let me um, let me graph that over here. Got too many things open. Ah. All right, let's just redefine f to be uh, eighty and two hundred eighteen. Okay, and we'll just. Uh, So if I plot from uh, create a beta distribution, then it looks something like this, okay? Which seems to kind of represent, you know, our beliefs about um, our beliefs about the uh, baseball player, okay? So we're gonna say. Um, so our prior distribution, probability of theta, is proportional, well, we'll say is equal to the beta distribution with parameters 81 to 19, which is proportional to theta raised to the 80th and 1 minus theta raised to the 218. Our likelihood, what is our likelihood? Likelihood of the data. 
This is the probability of the data given theta. This, again, our data is 10 at bats, 5 hits. And so this ends up being theta raised to the fifth times 1 minus theta to the 10 minus 5 raised to the fifth. Is that okay? So this part's the same as from maximum likelihood estimation, because in maximum likelihood estimation, you're just taking the likelihood function, which is this, and you're trying to find its maximum. And then uh, the probability of data, the uh, marginal, marginal probability, probability of the data is a constant. whose purpose is that the probability of theta given the data will integrate to 1. And we don't need to bother calculating it, OK? I mean, we can, but it's not necessary, OK? So using Bayes' rule, What we have is the probability of theta given data is equal to this okay and because this is a constant we can uh, just say this whole thing is just proportional to this. It's just proportional to the numerator. This will just make our lives a little bit easier. Okay. And anyway, we we only have this. This thing is just proportional anyway. Okay. So we've got uh, the probability of theta given data is going to be proportional to theta to the fifth one minus theta to the fifth times the probability of theta, which is going to be theta to the 80th times 1 minus theta to the uh, 218. OK. And this is nice, because all of our terms are kind of in common. So we get what? Theta to the 85th and 1 minus theta to the uh, 223. Is that okay? Theta to the 85, 1 minus theta to the 223, right? And uh, and so we have this, and we can say, well, can we uh, can we plot this? Sure, sure, we can plot this. Okay. So let me call this f two, and this will be theta to the eighty five, one minus s to the two twenty three. Okay, and um, let's apply the function. And let's uh, add lines, sp2, and let's do uh, color equals red. Oh, we got to, uh, multiply by normalizing constant. I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat here. Okay. All right. Give me a second.
Okay. Um, so, so this is what has happened. So, if if I graph the functions in their raw form, uh, we we end up with some issues because they. Uh, uh, you know they they multiply the the constants aren't quite there so I have to I have to make some adjustments there but um, basically if we just graph them so that the shapes are similar this is what we end up having so our original distribution prior to looking at any data was kind of you know centered around point to something ish, okay. You know, small values around 0.2, small values for anything over like in this case like 0.35 ish, okay. And then we saw the player have 10 at bats and get five hits, okay. And so rather than just jumping to the conclusion that this player now has a batting average of 0.5, what we've done is we say, okay, this player has done well. So maybe this player is a little bit better than average. And so we tweak our distribution of theta, and we just adjust it, shift it a little bit higher. Okay? And this thing is basically is proportional to, to this function here. Okay? So we took the, um, the likelihood theta to the fifth times one minus theta to the fifth. This is the likelihood of our data, and we combined it with our prior distribution, and we get this, okay? And, uh, and if we look at this, this is, if we recall that the beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta is equal to, um, theta to the alpha minus 1 and 1 minus theta to the beta minus 1, we see that this thing can be rewritten in the form of, because it's just proportional, we can say it's proportional to uh, a beta distribution with alpha equal to what? 86 and beta equal to 224. Is that okay? Because this is the PDF of the beta distribution. All right, so in, in Bayesian statistics, this is, uh, this is what we have. We say, Prior to looking at any information about the baseball player, this is this is our beliefs about the uh, the player's um, skill. After seeing their at bats, we can adjust uh, what we believe to be uh, the player's player's skill. Okay. So we've got um, the prior distribution. Theta was beta distribution 81 to 19. And this basically said values between 0.2 and 0.3 are likely. Values much higher or lower. The data, likelihood. Is theta to the fifth, one minus theta to the fifth. This is just using the binomial slash Bernoulli 
um, probabilities. And our um, posterior then is proportional to theta to the 85th times 1 minus theta to the 223, okay, which is going to be proportional to a beta distribution with parameters 86 and 224. And what this is, is looks similar to the prior, but is shifted to be a little higher. Okay, which basically takes into account Ten at bats and five hits. Let me, uh, let me just copy that. Yes, question. I was just wondering where you got the 81. Yeah. Um, <coughs> let, let, I'll explain that in a, in a moment here, OK? It's a little bit arbitrary, or a lot of bit ar arbitrary, OK? But um, we'll kind of we'll kind of go from there. Um, so yeah, let me explain the beta distribution in a moment. But before I do that, are there any questions on kind of this process here? Okay. So again, the contrast is maximum likelihood estimation. You're just taking the data and you're making a conclusion based on that. You're trying to just find the value of theta, your value of your parameter that maximizes the likelihood. In Bayesian statistics, you are taking into account what we consider prior knowledge. Okay, and this is kind of the people's biggest beef with Bayesian statistics, because this prior knowledge does feel arbitrary, and it's absolutely true. That's a valid concern, right? Here we said, I know something about baseball. I know that batting averages should are never 0.5 in real life. Okay? Career batting averages are never going to be as high as 0.5, and they're never going to be as low as 0.1. I should take that into account when I'm going to make a judgment at the end, when we're going to say, what do we think this player's batting average is at the end of the day? I should take that into account so I don't come, walk away and say, hey, this guy ha had good a good outing, 10 at-bats and 5 hits. I'm going to guess that his player's batting average is going to be 0.5. No, we say, I should take into account what I understand about baseball and walk away with something different, okay? And and that's what we've done here. And uh, um, but yeah, if we started off with a different prior distribution, then our result would also be different, okay? Whoops. And um, the uh, the other aspect to keep in mind is that. At the end of the day, we have a distribution on theta. Okay, we don't have a single estimate of theta. We don't say um, our best guess for theta is this. We just have a distribution. We say the player's true batting average could be any value coming from this beta distribution. Sure, its most likely value is 0.3, whatever, but um, but it's uh, the um, but it's a distribution nonetheless. Okay, let's let's take a moment and discuss the uh, beta distribution. 
Okay. Okay, so the beta distribution, this again is a distribution of probabilities. Okay, so its support is always 0 to 1, okay? Because probabilities are always on the range of 0 to 1, so the support of the beta distribution it will always be uh, 0 to 1, okay? And, uh, and the probability of theta, um, we'll say given parameters alpha and beta, this is equal to uh, gamma alpha plus beta, gamma alpha, gamma beta, theta to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus theta to the beta minus 1. Okay. Um, uh, the semicolon is generally uh, given parameter values. Okay. So you've got like given your data, you'll use like a vertical bar or given a certain value, you got a vertical bar. But then if it's like you're defining a distribution given parameter values, we often use a semicolon. It's not wrong to use the vertical bar, but just notationally we use the semicolon. So. Uh, and again, this part which looks scary is just a constant. So all you have to know is that all PDFs must integrate to one. So this serves the purpose so that this part over here will integrate to 1, okay? That's this part, which looks scary, is just there so that this side over here integrates to 1. Because if we just integrated this side, it's not going um, to add up to 1. Okay, what we can imagine, you can imagine the beta distribution being something like this, okay? We've got a bucket. Okay, this is my beautiful picture of a bucket here. And um, basically, into the bucket, I'm going to put in some marbles. Okay. And, uh, and the marbles come in two colors. All right. We'll put in, um, I don't know, red marbles and blue marbles. Okay. So I can put in a blue marble. I can put in a red marble. Okay, so if you observe, let me put in one red and one blue. Let's say, uh, not if, we'll just say you observe me put in one red marble and one blue marble. And then I have you close your eyes, okay, and then you hear me dump a whole bunch more marbles in, okay. I, um, I dump a lot more marbles in. Okay, and they're either going to be red or blue. But you have no idea what. Okay, I dump a lot more marbles in. You don't know what I put in. Okay, and then I ask, what proportion of the marbles are red? Ask, what proportion of the marbles in the bucket are red? You've seen me put in one red and one blue, and I just dumped in a whole bunch more marbles. So what's your answer? Is Your answer is, I don't know. It could be anywhere from, like, all the marbles you put in could have been red and we have something like 0.99999% red, 
okay? Or it could be uh, all the marbles you dumped in were blue, and so it could be point zero 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 one red, okay? Uh -huh. We don't know, right? So what proportion of the marbles are red? Well, this can be defined as what I saw you put in was one red and one blue. So we're going to say alpha is one, beta is one. And this ends up being uniform zero, one, okay? Which basically says any proportion from zero to one, these are all equally likely. That's that's what that is, all right? Um, okay. Uh, let's say you hear me put in, or, or you see, observe me put in a few more marbles, right? And I realize this this is not the best analogy, okay? But this I'm just trying to get you a picture of kind of the relationship between these one values here, okay? Um, this time. You see me put in uh, one blue, what's going on here? One blue and uh, and six red. Okay. And then again, you close your eyes, and then I put in some marbles. Okay, and I realize our answer depends on like how many marbles you hear me dump. Like if you hear me dump like an entire bag, then then maybe this doesn't work. But um, no, I'm I'm so sorry. It's not that you see me put in one blue and one red. I messed that up. I pull out one blue and I pull out one red. Okay. So, um, okay. So now, what we've got going on here, see, is uh, I apologize. I I got this part mixed up. <coughs> Okay, and so from the bucket, I draw seven marbles at random, okay? And we see one blue, one red. And then now I ask, what proportion of the bucket is red? Okay. So, um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one blue and six red. Yeah. What we see one blue and six red. Sorry. Thank you for that. Okay. So, so again, in the beginning, you saw me put in one blue and one red, and then I dumped in a bunch of marbles, right? And then I ask, well, what, what do you think's in here, right? And you're like, I don't know. Could be anything. Could be. 0% to 100% red, you know, so, I mean, not 100%, but very close to that, right? Okay, but now we say, all right, we, we, you know, we stir it up, and I draw some marbles from the bucket. We see one blue, and we see one red, right? And I say, okay, what proportion of the bucket is red? Okay, the answer is you still don't know, okay? The proportion that's red could technically still be anywhere from zero to a hundred percent, okay, or something um, close to that. But based on this, what proportion of red seems likely to you? Okay, something around eighty something percent, right? Like we wouldn't expect. Like if it turned out that the bucket 
was just 10% red, that would be shocking to us. We're like, it was only 10% red, how did I get six red, right? Okay. Um, and on the other hand, if it turned out to be uh, like 99.9% .9 red, that would also be shocking to us because you're like, how did I get that blue, right? But if you tell if if I tell you, oh, you know what, the bucket was 85% red, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense, right? If I tell you it was 90% red, you'd be like, okay, that's fine, right? If I tell you it's 50% red, you'd be like, huh, that's weird. Why did I only get one blue, right? This is this is kind of what you would you you would expect. And so, how do we represent what we believe to be about the bucket? and its proportion, okay? This is represented with a beta distribution of, uh, uh, it's, it's gonna be uh, seven, seven and two, <laughs> okay? Okay, what proportion of the bucket is red? This ends up being, um, okay, so we can represent our beliefs about, uh, you know, the proportion with the beta distribution. Okay, so 10% um, red is very unlikely. Okay, also 99.9% .9 red is very unlikely. Okay, 85% red seems likely. 90% sounds, sounds reasonable. Fifty percent seems uh, strange. And we would represent this with a beta distribution of alpha equal to 7, which is going to be 1 plus 6, and a beta of 2, which is 1 plus 1, because we observed 6 red and 1 blue. Kind of like that, OK? And, uh, and let me just kind of show you what uh, a beta distribution looks like. So if I have... Uh, P3 to be D beta S um, 7, 2. Okay, this is this is what we would get, something around here. Okay, so 0.999. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Oh man, it's eleven fifty-four. Okay. I'm always going over time, but but thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, um, so anyway, those numbers eighty-one and two nineteen were kind of arbitrarily selected to uh, kind of represent this uh, this belief system here. But uh, we'll 